So let's kick off this video actually with a brief review of the last thing that we said in video, the first video of this lecture, of lecture number nine. So I'm showing you the slide um, right here. This is the same one as from the first video. Um, and you might recall that, you know, at that point, I was trying to really hammer home um, that on the one hand, the choice of the consensus protocol, and on the other hand, the choice of the mechanism for civil resistance, those are really independent decisions and they should not be conflated. And so to really belabor that point, I, we drew this two by two matrix, um, right? So with the rows labeled by possible civil, civil resistance mechanisms, so proof of work in the top row, proof of stake, something we'll talk about in lecture number 12, um, proof of stake on the bottom row. And then the columns are labeled with the choice of the consensus protocol, right? So longest chain in the first column, um, BFT type consensus in the spirit of tendermint uh, in the second column. Now, I'm not saying that either of these axes is exhaustive. It's not. There's definitely consensus protocols out there that aren't really properly classified as either longest chain or BFT type. There are approaches to civil resistance other than proof of work and proof of stake. But still, you know, a majority of the so-called layer one blockchain protocols, you can generally fit into one of these four boxes. So, for example, Bitcoin famously uses Nakamoto consensus, by which I mean longest chain consensus, uh, along with proof of work, uh, civil resistance. Um, Solana is a well-known blockchain, which is a proof of stake blockchain, um, which is, you know, more or less uh, a BFT type of consensus protocol. Um, you don't see that many proof of stake longest chain protocols, but you do see some. And like Carb Cardano would be an, a, a well-known example of something that occupies the lower left cell. And I'm actually unaware of any blockchain protocol in production which occupies the upper right cell, which couples proof of work civil resistance with BFT type consensus. So in this video, in the sixth video, I want to actually state for you um, a kind of formal impossibility result, um, which explains why it's probably not a good idea to try to mix and match um, proof of work with BFT type consensus. So that's the first question we want to address. Could it ever be sensible to mix proof of work and BFT type consensus? The impossibility result we'll talk about in this video actually sheds light also on a, a second question, um, which is basically, you know, can we have, can we improve longest chain consensus um, so we get non-trivial consistency guarantees even in the partially synchronous setting? So just a brief reminder, at the partially synchronous setting, that was that sweet spot model um, that we talked about in lecture number six, um, where basically you do allow attacks, you know, like denial of service attacks or network outages, uh, of unbounded but finite duration, right? So that's the model where we had the global stabilization time. Before GST, all bets are off about message delivery. After GST, um, it behaves like the synchronous model with all messages arriving within uh, capital delta time units for some known parameter capital delta. The parameter GST is unknown. That should be interpreted as the length of the attack or the outage. And again, um, we're, we're not going to assume any a priori bound on how long the attack goes on, but we do assume that it ends eventually. Now, the Tendermint Protocol, which we discovered and uh, um, talked about in lecture number seven, um, one of its claims to fame is that it actually retains consistency, right? So nodes keep staying in sync even when you're under attack, okay? So even in the partially synchronous setting, even before the global stabilization time. You might recall that's why we were sort of bothering with sort of two stages of voting and sort of quorum certificates, you know, with a supermajority of agreeing votes from each of the two stages. That's what gave us that consistency property even when we're under attack for the Tendermint Protocol in lecture number seven. Now, for longest chain consensus, on the other hand, um, you might remember we wrapped up lecture number eight by pointing out that longest chain consensus does not enjoy consistency um, in the partially synchronous setting. Attacks and network outages can really mess up consistency for longest chain consensus. So remember, the intuition for this was actually quite simple. You just think about a network partition. So in our minds, we just imagine separate the nodes running the protocol into one group A and one group B. Um, and then we just, you know, then the, we assume that the network just delays messages between A and B for some, uh, un, for some unknown period of time. So messages amongst the nodes of A, they all sort of arrive promptly. Same thing with the messages within um, the nodes in B. But anything across the groups, that's delayed for a, a long period of time. Uh, and so if you have a network partition like that, if you're running longest chain consensus, basically A, you know, the nodes in A will just grow their own longest chain. The nodes of B will grow their own longest chain. And if that happens for a long enough period, those chains will even exceed in length the security parameter uh, K. And at that point, the nodes in A and the nodes in B will have different opinions about which have been the blocks that have been finalized so far. And that's a violation of consistency. So we've proven a lot of nice guarantees about longest chain consensus by this point. But let me remind you, 
all of those guarantees are for the synchronous model. They are not for the partially synchronous model. And we saw sort of by a concrete example that actually longest chain consensus, at least as we've studied it thus far, um, does not have nice properties in the partially synchronous model. Now, you know, right, as a, as a researcher or an engineer, right, you always want to keep doing better, right? So it's like, great, we have longest chain consensus. It's great we have these guarantees in the synchronous model. But you got to wonder, like, maybe we could tweak the protocol, right? Maybe add just like a little bit of extra complexity so that in addition to all of the nice guarantees we get in the synchronous model, maybe we can also get, for example, consistency in the partially synchronous model. So the impossibility result, um, which I'll state next, uh, basically answers both of these questions uh, in the negative. It is generally not sensible to combine proof of work with BFT type consensus. Um, and there's no uh, sort of obvious way to modify Nakamoto consensus. So proof of work civil resistance along with longest chain consensus um, in order to get non-trivial guarantees in the partially synchronous model. All right, so the formal statement, um, and you know, maybe this was, you know, to some extent folklore, but uh, as far as uh, stating and proving it formally, you can find that in a paper of mine, uh, along with Andrew Lewis Pai uh, from 2020 called Resource Pools and the Cap Theorem. Uh, and the formal statement says that if you're talking about a proof of work blockchain, so if you're using proof of work um, civil resistance, uh, then you have to choose between either having liveness in the synchronous setting uh, or consistency in the partially synchronous setting. You cannot have both. Uh, and in fact, this impossibility result holds even in the event that none of the nodes are Byzantine, that all of the nodes are honest. So it's constructive to interpret those two cells from that two by two matrix, the two proof of work cells um, in the context of this uh, theorem. So if we think about Nakamoto consensus, as we've studied it, so longest chain consensus plus proof of work, um, civil resistance, uh, you know, that does satisfy one. Yeah, that satisfies one kind of even in the synchronous setting, even with up to 49% of the hash rate um, being Byzantine. So it certainly satisfies liveness when delta equals zero um, and you have no Byzantine hash rate. And so this theorem then says it is then a foregone conclusion that Nakamoto consensus will not satisfy um, consistency in the partially synchronous setting. Now, it's very easy to observe directly um, that longest chain consensus and proof of work simple resistance wasn't consistent in the partially synchronous setting. We sort of didn't need this theorem to observe that. But this theorem really says it's something fundamental that is driving that weakness um, of Bitcoin and other protocols that use Nakamoto consensus. It is an inevitable byproduct of having sort of liveness um, guarantees in the synchronous setting and being proof of work that inevitably forces you to give up on consistency in the partially synchronous setting. Suppose, on the other hand, we tried to couple proof-of-work civil resistance with BFT-type consensus. I'm not going to sort of go into a lot of detail about what this might mean, um, but, you know, intuitively, like, so for longest chain consensus, we needed to choose one leader in each round, and so we used this sort of proof-of-work lottery to do that. Uh, if we want to run BFT-type uh, consensus, uh, we might want to choose a committee of nodes. So maybe, you know, one leader to propose the block, you know, and then another, I don't know, 100 nodes um, to contribute the voting. Uh, but you can imagine using these same hard puzzles, using these same lotteries to choose not just on average one node per round, but on average, say, 100 nodes per round. And then whoever, you know, the 100 nodes that happen to solve a hard puzzle in a given period of time, they are the ones tasked with carrying out, um, you know, something like the, the Tendermint protocol. Now, it's totally possible in principle to build a blockchain protocol that works exactly like that. And in fact, in lecture number 12, we'll talk about blockchain protocols that do work exactly like that, except with the proof of work kind of um, method of selecting a random committee replaced by a proof of stake uh, based method. Um, and if you did build a blockchain protocol like that, it's, um, you know, if you did it properly, you would wind up getting the second of these guarantees. So you would inherit Tendermint's um, guarantee that you have consistency in the partially synchronous setting. You can think of this almost as sort of like a reduction from permissionless consensus to permissioned consensus and extending Tendermint's guarantees to the permissionless setting. But so if you do that, or for that matter, if you build any other proof of uh, work blockchain that for any reason happens to satisfy uh, consist consistency in the partially synchronous setting, this theorem tells you you must necessarily be giving up on liveness even in the synchronous setting. 
And if you think about it, that seems like um, kind of a deal breaker, right? Like, why would you ever deploy a blockchain protocol where you can't even guarantee liveness, even when the communication network um, is operating well? So, you know, I would speculate that's why I'm, I've never seen a, a blockchain protocol that combines uh, proof of work along with BFT type consensus. I do want to emphasize that this theorem is specifically for proof of work blockchains. And in lecture number 12, when we talk about proof of stake blockchains, we will see examples of where you can get these properties one and two simultaneously. Arguably, those proof of stake blockchains are a little less permissionless than the proof of work blockchains we're talking about right now. Um, but in exchange for sort of needing to some degree, some amount of registration by nodes, um, you are able to get sort of both of these properties. So let's talk about why this theorem is true. And in particular, you might be sort of surprised that this could be true even when you have no Byzantine node, no Byzantine hash rate at all. That seems kind of crazy. Um, but you know, we are, use, we are going to use the fact that the amount of hash rate in the system may vary over time. So the one sentence summary of why this theorem is true is that in a proof of work blockchain, you cannot distinguish between waning hash power and delayed messages. And notice both of these two obstacles are present even if all of the hash rate is honest, right? Hash rate may sort of go up and go down whether or not you have any Byzantine hash rate or not. Um, and, you know, messages may get delayed, right? If you just have sort of a trouble with your communication network, again, whether or not uh, any of the nodes are Byzantine. To be a little bit more precise about this, you know, zoom in on some honest node I. And imagine at some period of time, it just, you, it just literally stops hearing about any new blocks from any of the other nodes uh, in the system. One possible explanation for why node I is no longer hearing about new blocks is maybe all of the other hash rate disappeared. Maybe all of the other nodes just sort of turned off their machines. On the other hand, maybe there's tons of other nodes sort of happily humming along, but maybe we happen to be in the partially synchronous model prior to global stabilization time, and just all of and those other honest nodes have been trying to inform node I about the blocks they've created, but those messages just haven't arrived yet. And now you really got to pity poor uh, node I, because node I is really in a catch-22, damned if it does, damned if it doesn't. Node I has to decide, you know, whether or not it's going to keep finalizing new blocks or not. Either it just stops or it keeps going. So suppose node I is a little bit aggressive and it's like, well, for, for all I know, I'm the only person capable of producing blocks, so I guess I better keep producing and finalizing blocks. The problem, of course, you know, maybe node I guessed wrong, and actually the reason it hadn't heard anything is because um, other honest nodes' messages are delayed. And so those other honest nodes are also sort of finalizing their own blocks. Um, and that means, you know, uh, we're getting a consistency violation uh, in the partially synchronous setting. And you have to concede the only other option for node I is to really never finalize any blocks, to just keep waiting, you know, hoping for some sort of future global stabilization time. The problem, of course, is, you know, maybe we're not in the partially synchronous setting. Maybe we're even in the synchronous setting, even with delta equals zero. Um, but all of the other nodes turned off their computers. Uh, so node I is actually literally the only one capable of finalizing any new blocks. So if it's not doing it, nobody's doing it. And so that's a loss of liveness. That's a violation of property one. All right, so that completes the proof. And again, just sort of the one sentence to remember um, is, you know, why fundamentally with proof of work blockchains do you have to make this kind of stark choice between um, sort of a very basic liveness condition and um, consistency in the partially synchronous model? It's because in a proof of work setting, nodes cannot distinguish between um, the scenario where the hash rate is waning versus the scenario where messages are being delayed by long periods of time. So this theorem, you know, I hope it strikes you as sort of rather basic. Um, and so you're probably wondering, like, why wouldn't this just hold, you know, generally for permissionless consensus? Like, why is this specifically about proof of work blockchains? And in fact, proof of stake blockchains that we'll talk about in lecture number 12 can evade this impossibility result. Um, we'll get more into it kind of when we get to lecture 12. But just in case you're wondering right now, um, fundamentally, with a proof of stake blockchain, it's no longer true that honest nodes can't differentiate between sort of weight, uh, waning power by other nodes and delayed messages. Uh, and the reason is that sort of the amount of stake everybody has is just recorded on the blockchain itself. So by virtue of nodes sort of keeping track of the blockchain, they are also keeping track of exactly how much power the other nodes have. So if all of the other nodes suddenly have no power, an honest node is going to be able to see that just from the record on the blockchain. Whereas in a proof of work setting, right, if other nodes turn off their machines, you have no idea. 
right? So the blockchain state remains exactly the same. Other nodes have sort of disappeared. You have no way of knowing whether or not that has in fact happened. Whereas with proof of stake blockchains, you can immediately tell whether or not that has in fact happened. So that's why this theorem does not, this proof as is, does not hold for the proof of stake case. And as we'll see in lecture number 12, actually there do exist proof of stake blockchains that get both of these properties, uh, one and two. All right, so we're almost done with lecture number nine. Uh, the one remaining order of business is, uh, is a very short video where we're just going to sort of give you an orientation um, over the next four of what the next four lectures are going to be about, lectures uh, 10 through 13. So I'll see you there.